Welcome to the Sloth Investor Podcast with your host, Mr. Sloth. The information on this podcast is provided for education and informational purposes only. The information contained in or provided from or through this podcast is not intended to be and does not constitute advice of any kind. Welcome everyone to episode 24 of the Sloth Investor Podcast, an investing podcast that explores why I believe the humble sloth is the best animal to characterize successful investing. Once again, I'm joined by my fellow sloth investor and co-host Jay. Jay, we have taken a long extended break from it, the podcast. It was a long break. Oh my gosh. And you know, in fact, while preparing for this episode, I noticed that our last podcast episode, I noted this down, it was released on May 30th, you know, between the two of us, we, the last episode we were on together. And we're recording this episode on September the 6th. So that's a distance of 99 days between then to now. And by the time this episode is released, it'll be over 100 days. So I guess you could say that we're finally back in a saddle. Jay, how are you and how was your summer? Well, we're back, baby. We're back. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I am to be back in the saddle. And uh, here we are hosting the podcast. And the irony is um, you talked about 99 days between episodes. And as a Canadian from who hails from the city of Brantford, Ontario, I really identify with the number 99 because... My hometown is the hometown of Wayne Gretzky, number 99, the greatest ice hockey player of all time. So the the irony that he's my favorite all-time player, him and I are from the same hometown, and uh, the difference in our um, podcast to this podcast is 99 days. I like it. And there was me as well thinking you were going to bring out a Jay-Z reference. Is it 99 <laughs> Problems? Is that, is, that, is that a song? <laughs> no, no. Problems? I'm hoping to uh, to uh, not talk about problems now. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the good things. I and mean, you know what? Along the good things, my, my summer was fantastic. Oh. I was back in Canada. I was back there with my kids. Yeah. Um, they had an incredible summer running around with the kids in the neighborhood, playing in the water, out in the sun. Um, it was it was It was probably the best summer I could have asked for for my kids what about you perfect i mean likewise i mean my family we went back to the uk and just so fantastic to see friends and family who hadn't been back for three years and wow, um, three years three years so long went to see a few shows in london took the kids to mary poppins and can did i catch just, any concerts <gasps> did i catch any concerts jay now that is the question jay you know and i think regular listeners of the podcast know i am a massive fan of the rolling stones you are i am would you I, believe it i did not know that oh my god <laughs> saw them twice jay saw them in london hyde park July the third saw them in paris a few weeks later and i don't just want to go and see the stones and be say 200 meters away from the stage I queued for about eight hours for both shows. I uh, kid you not. You're I'm, committed. You I'm, should be committed. I am committed. And both <laughs> shows, particularly the Paris show, I got ever so close to the front. I was, you know, within meters of, of Mick and the boys and an amazing, amazing experience to see them both up close. And, you know, it goes back to what we said as well in previous episodes, I think particularly episode 13, about the importance of experiences, okay? In, being engaged in an experience like that, being with fellow Stones fans, seeing my favorite band up close, and going back to the fact that, you know, you and I both had so many great experiences with our friends and family back in our respective countries, really important to do. So yeah, I think we both had great summers from the sounds of it. Well, I'm disappointed you didn't catch a third concert. A real fan would have caught, fit in well, three concerts. It's interesting you should say that. I, you know, I got talking to a, a lovely guy from Denmark at the Paris show, and he was seeing the Stones on seven occasions this summer. Oh, that's a super fan right there. That is a super fan. Total fanboy. I know, completely. I was in admiration of him. I don't know how he could afford it, but complete admiration, definitely so. <laughs> you know, so guys, anyone who's listening, you know, it's interesting that we both mention experiences as this reminds me of a fantastic article that I read recently, okay? So it was written by Derek Thompson and was published in The Atlantic at the beginning of this month, on September 1st, in fact. And the title of the article was a provocative one. And the title is, All the Personal Finance Books Are Wrong. You Talk know, about grabbing your grabbing a grabbing your attention right off the hop as someone who likes yeah. to read this kind of stuff, right? I know. I mean, I mean, that's definitely a title that, like you say, hooked me in immediately. So, if you are someone that's interested in personal finance, like Jay and I are, and you know, that's something that hooked me in. Okay, and so for anyone that's interested in reading the article, I'll provide a link to it in the description for today's episode. However, 
I'll now expand on what I consider to be one of the key points from the article, and that is what Thompson has to say about saving, and in particular, the often quoted advice to maintain a double digit savings rate. Okay, so this is what Thompson has to say. Begin quote Life itself is the ultimate scarce asset. The future is a noble, and religiously maintaining a double digit savings rate through the worst scores of life. It's not, of the most, it's not of the utmost importance. Having that special dinner with friends at 23 is, for instance, more valuable than having a couple hundred extra dollars in your retirement fund at 73. By this logic, building a budget that makes you comfortable and happy in the short term, even if that means varying your savings rate from decade to decade or year to year, is the better approach. He goes on to state, those who spend a lifetime delaying gratification may one day find themselves rich in savings, but poor in memories, having sacrificed too much joy at the altar of compounding interest. End quote. So for me, what Thompson states here about memories and life itself being the ultimate scarce asset very much times with the key focus of episode 13 of the Sloth Investor Podcast i.e. the importance of experiences to one's happiness in life. Connecting to this theme of memories and life experiences, I read an article in The Guardian just yesterday that a British retailer, John Lewis, is introducing a new slogan, which is being there for all life's moments. Okay, Being there for all life's moments. So, Actually, that's great. That is a I great like that's it. That's a great slogan. Yeah, Catchy. I, I really like it. And the pledge is designed to tap into what, the department, the, or the department store chain is billing as the moment's economy, okay? The moment's economy. So as Brits spend smaller amounts on enjoying day-to-day life, from hosting a dinner party to celebrating a dog's par- birthday, rather than splurging on a set-piece item. So, well, there's a lot to unpack there. So the new slogan from John Lewis, for all life's moments, the notion of a moment's economy, the idea of life itself being an ultimate scarce asset, I just have to read that quote from Derek Thompson again because I love it. Those who spend a lifetime delaying gratification may one day find themselves rich in savings but poor in memories, having sacrificed too much joy at the altar of compounding interest. Jay, what are your thoughts on all of this? Well, as you read that, and uh, do you watch Netflix? I do, I do. And uh, do you know uh, Marie uh, Marie Kondo? You know I've heard of her and I know her kind of jazz, the gist of what she's about, but I've not actually watched her in action, if you like. Interestingly, she's a minimalist, right? So she's talking about getting rid of the clutter and getting rid of the junk. And and one of her benchmark questions is, does it bring you joy? Mm, And I've actually tried to really lean into that. Um, Does it bring me joy? And, And probably... You know, much to the chagrin of someone like Andrew Hellam, Andrew Hellam would, we bought a new vehicle um, about this time last year. And... Uh, Andrew Hellam would have said, you know, look, you don't need something with uh, a lot of the the bells and whistles. Mm. But then I started to reframe it in terms of Marie Kondo. We spend a lot of time in our vehicle, and mm. it's something that I like to have a nice vehicle. And so I had to balance that with finding something that's affordable, but something that actually I really, really like. And yeah. and I'm trying to find that um, almost that it's a it's about enjoying the time that you have in your car. I didn't want to be driving around something that I thought maybe like, oh, far out. I wish I had these more options. Mm-hmm. I really, um, and when I do have our vehicle, I actually really like it. I enjoy yeah. my time in that vehicle and I find that it's almost, almost like a, um, a, a Zen moment when I'm driving and we're, mm. we're in a vehicle that I like and it's got plenty of room for my family and my dogs. I, I, I really enjoy um, that. I, I'm, I'm very happy that I spent the extra money to get the vehicle that, I thought we would enjoy. Yeah, you kind of get in that zone, that comfort level, and you think, you know, this is nice. It's worth spending a little bit extra just to have that comfort. And it's interesting because when we consider investing, the term risk profile is often used. But I guess if you're reading a personal finance book, you could think about, you know, your personal finance profile because <clears throat> I think it's important to take a nuanced look into, you know, what you're reading if it's a particular office, you know, take on finance. And yeah, 
while of course we both advocate the importance of of saving and you know securing a good nest egg for yourself at the same time it's important to kind of recognize that you want to enjoy life and if it means splashing a little bit extra on this or that whether it be a car whatever it might be then i i, I can definitely you know i agree with that you're gonna get behind it and yeah. what, what are the hong kong being in hong kong one of the big sort of social events <laughs> is going out for a meal. Mm. And, you know, the, 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 the quote you just read talked about going out for a meal. Yeah. And this is, if you decide, oh, I'm not going to do that, um, you're going to be missing out on those memories and those opportunities. And I yeah. know even for, in our our friendship group, the a lot of things are sent around, like, let's go meet up downtown and uh, yeah. we'll grab uh, something to eat and drink. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's how we, you know, we, we, we go for a hike, we finish off the hike with, uh, a moment of uh, we're going to spend be spending some money. Yeah, go for yeah. a drink and a bite. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely for sure. So, Jake, at the top of the show, we mentioned that it was great to be able to travel back to our respective respective countries this summer. I got to admit, something I love to do when I'm back in the UK is to lay sloth like with the daily papers. You know, in fact, I will confess that I enjoy reading British papers so much that I've got a subscription to one on my phone and I regularly use it here in Hong Kong. You can do that. You can read the newspaper yeah. on your phone. It, it, it's something I love okay. to do. And you know, you know, from time to time, we know listeners, you know, the news can be a bit dreary and uh, there's a lot going on in the UK at the moment. I think new prime minister say won't get into it on the day of filming, the <laughs> recording. But I do like to, you know, I've got certain columnists I like reading and certain, uh, you know, articles day to day that'll be published. And I was reading an article in the Sunday Times by Matthew Said, one of my favorite columnists, and I found myself nodding along with the sentiment of the piece. Indeed, I found myself thinking about my fourth Bedrock Principle time when reading it. In particular, Said talks about our contemporary need for instant gratification. And although it's a lengthy extract, I'd like to read from the article now. Okay, begin quote. This is from Matthew Said. I can't help thinking that we have undergone a reverse transformation in cultural attitudes over the past generation or two, and the past couple of decades in particular. We live in a society where the political virtues of long-term planning and strategic patience have been replaced by an obsession with the here and now. Attention spans have dwindled in the age of instant news. Computer games are algorithmically optimized to provide sugar rush hits, measurable as released oxytocin in the hippocampus. Gratification is no longer rapid, it's instant. These trends have been accelerated by social media, reputations won and lost in the time it takes for an allegation to go viral. But so has the cultural poison of reality television, where the concept of instant success has become part of the view and entertainment of millions. The idea of achieving something through long-term sacrifice has become almost passe. And as time has sped up, our capacity to think about the long-term has been dangerously compromised. The future is now a faraway place inhabited by strangers. The tragedy, of course, is that the strangers are us. End quote. Jay, I'm amazed I was able to get through that completely. Yeah, that's that's impressive. That's wow. impressive. But it was it's going through that, it's and maybe our listeners, um, you can you can um, text in uh, a response to this. Did it something tells me did I read that um, the news now um, last about a seven minutes before a yeah. uh, uh, next oh. headline. So that in terms of that, is what was the line that gratification is no longer rapid, it's instant. Yeah. And you want the next sensational headline. So, you know, whereas previously things that we might have read about Boris Johnson or yeah. Donald Trump yeah. would shock us yeah. and it would last for a long time. I think, I, did I read, and again, I'll put out the, to, the, to, the, to the listeners, is it seven minutes that it lasts before we move on to sort of the next headline and the next uh, the next piece of sensationalism yeah. interesting interesting and, it, and I, you know I, i've seen this before this before it makes you wonder about the enduring what it seems now the popularity of long form podcasts we think about people out there such as joe rogan others who had these three four hour podcasts because there is this appetite for people to engage in you know sustained forms of conversation because perhaps from the traditional uh you know forms of media whether it's the bbc or cnn they're getting these you know short soundbite news segments and they want longer form duration discussion so it is fascinating to think about isn't it really yeah in that respect so going back circling back to saeed's article so although of course it wasn't necessarily written for investors i couldn't help but draw a parallel to the realm of investing okay when i'm thinking about attention spans and you know, 
the, I, the, the notion of having a long-term sacrifice, okay? So as I mentioned on this podcast series before, it's no secret that some of the best stock returns of the past decade have been those that have found stocks, such as Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Paradoxically, however, and this is what Said also points towards in his article, our contemporary conveniences have undoubtedly compelled many of us to think in the short term. Said's article also got me thinking about something that Rob Feeling, the author of children's financial literacy book, Emma's for Money, and my guest for episode 23, mentioned about how we as parents can be financial role models to our children. On this point, I completely agree with Rob. It's a great book. It's a great yeah, book. Yeah, lovely book, isn't it? Um, I also believe there's tremendous merit in modeling the importance of time, patience, and delayed gratification to our children. We want them to recognize that many rewards in life aren't necessarily instant, that it takes patience, repetition, a devotion to a sustained commitment of time for success to be achieved. So on this point, I think back to my late father. I guess you could say he occasionally developed what I now call sporadic 15-minute hobbies. For example, he had Spanish ancestry, so on one occasion he bought some resources to learn Spanish. However, he didn't pursue this for a sustained period of time. Moreover, my father was amazing with his hands. He could build anything, was great with crafts. I learned a lot from him in that respect. But in particular, he was a really highly skilled mechanic. So one summer, he bought a beaten down Volkswagen Beetle and expressed a desire to restore it to its former glory. However, as with the acquisition of Spanish, the restored Beetle did not emerge. So don't get me wrong, this is not to disparage the memory of my late father, but merely to ponder on the extent to which we as parents, or to put it another way, we as stock investors, can model the concept, the concept of patience and a sustained commitment of time to our children. Jay, I know we've devoted an entire podcast episode to my fourth bedrock principle, mm -hmm. but any further thoughts on this key concept of time? Well, it, uh, the listeners know, that for anyone who's been a regular listener to this series, they, they know what, sort of my, my philosophy on what I teach my own children and sort of what I advocate for. Um, I, my children get an allowance. I don't buy them things so that if they want something, they have to save for it. Um, and on their birthdays, they get stock certificates. Um, and that's just how I roll and the the kids have the option my children have the option to cash in right there and then if they want or they can hold on to it um, what I'm happy to report back my daughter who is a little more um, laissez-faire with her her spending habits has now developed a savings habit and perhaps it was just a maturity thing my son's always had it um, he has his own accounting book. He's 15 wow. years old. Oh. He, he has a ledger, um, <laughs> which is amazing to That's see. That's a sensible 15 year old. I'll yeah, tell you. I love yeah. it. I absolutely love it. Um, he's meticulous, but he, he saves and he has goals. Uh, my daughter this summer, we really started to see a turnaround. And it's um, some of the things that we had been advocating for seem to have stuck with her now. So I guess if I'm, I'm talking to the parents out there, my advice would be stick with it. Um, mm. If you think that you're, it's not hitting home with your kids, um, try and stick with it and hold true to, to your values and your principles that you want to pass on to your children. Mm, definitely great advice. Definitely great advice. I like it indeed, indeed. And Jay, to the title of today's episode, 12 Years of Sloth, this refers to the inception of my journey as a sloth investor. So I arrived in Asia 12 years ago, and very soon after arriving, I remember reading Millionaire Teacher by Andrew Hallam. So although the concept of investing like a sloth, a sloth wasn't exactly born then, it's certainly true that the antecedents of my core bedrock principles of simplicity and time and remaining headstrong first arose shortly after reading the book. I was fortunate to have been handed a copy of the book, but to coin a phrase from my favorite band, <laughs> Jay, I, uh, I can't get no satisfaction. So having read um, Andrew Helen's work myself, mm. and knowing what um, we're seeing sort of in the world today, what do you, what do you attribute this, this lack of satisfaction to? Jay, that's a good question. Um, Jay, the time has come for me to expand the sloth empire. Oh, do tell. This is going to be interesting because I, uh, shout out to the listeners, I don't know what's coming up next, so this is going to be interesting. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Well, Jay, I'm excited to announce that on a fortnightly basis, I'll be using the Substack platform to release Mr. Sloth's blog. 
Okay, so this newsletter will contain my musings on investing, timeless stock investor quotes, recommended articles, recommended websites, and get ready for this, listeners, a free book giveaway every quarter. No way! Yeah. Oh, you know, get out of town! Yeah. So within the realm of investing, we know that every quarter a company will release their earnings results. There's always a lot of hoo-ha about that, but a free book giveaway every quarter. Oh, it's like a, a dividend. It, we did, yeah, I like for, it. For being a follower of you is, is a, a, a dividend for the uh, the people who are your uh, your followers. I like I like that spin of things. It's a quarterly dividend that is uh, very beneficial. I like it. I like that. I like that spin of things. I haven't thought of it that way. I like it. Listeners, Moreover, if you would like to hire Mr. Sloth to talk to your school, college, or organization about my five bedrock principles, or even on an individual basis, you'll find details in my fortnightly newsletter. You'll learn about how you can contact me. You know what? I, I, I so wish that, especially being an international teacher, that we had someone like you who had come in and not been selling a product, mm. um, not be not wanting us to invest in their product, mm. uh, and just told us straight up, this is the way it is. This is how you can take care of yourself. You don't need me as your intermediary to take care of you. Yeah, um, I can, you know, help you understand how to take care of yourself. So the big question is then, how do we get your book for the first giveaway? That's a great question, Jay. So. As I mentioned a little earlier, I recently enjoyed interviewing Rob Phelan, author of the children's book, M is for Money, in our previous episode. And so this is a book that I'm looking to send to a subscriber of my Substack platform. It's going to be the first book that I give away, okay? So to all those parents out there, this is a great book that can enable your child to obtain a good initial understanding of financial vocabulary such as invest and earn and taxes and a multitude of other financial vocabulary terms. Okay, so listeners, time to tune in at this moment. Tell the listeners, how do we take advantage of this offer you're putting out there, Mr. Sloth? Mm -hmm. So, in order to win a copy of M is for Money by Rob Fillin, you have to do three things. One, make sure you're a subscriber to my Substack platform and you'll find a link to this in the description for this episode. Make sure you're a subscriber. Two, email me at Mr. Sloth at slothinvestor.com explaining what makes you a sloth investor. Oh, great. I like that. I love that. You like that. that, yeah? Once again, email me at Mr. Sloth at slothinvestor.com explaining what makes you a sloth investor. And three, agree for me to publish your response should you be chosen at random in an upcoming edition of my Mr. Sloth's blog newsletter. So you're going to quote them? I'm going to quote them. They're going to be featured because, Jay, I think it's important that subscribers to my newsletter get an insight into how other investors invest. Because you know what? I think sometimes when it comes to financial media, we can learn about, you know, the, the guys and girls in the sharp suits, the, the guys and girls at Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. But what about the everyday sloth investor? How do they invest their money? What, what are the, the bedrock principles of Mr. Sloth that really resonate with them? And I think it's important that they know that. And I used to, I used to model myself after, like, I, I would see these big, rich people and like, oh, what are they doing? This is the this is the person I need to follow and emulate. And actually, when I started to talk to the everyday investor like yourself yeah. and uh, my colleagues around the school, I was like, mm. far out, actually, no, it's, this is, I don't need to be following the millionaire investors. I need to be doing what's a, a good investment strategy for me. And it's actually not very difficult. That's it. There's a reason why my first bedrock principle is simplicity. And, you know, to circle mm. back to some of the very earliest episodes, so think about, let's think about some of the, those investing icons, those influential investors that had such a profound effect upon me. Andrew Hallam, a teacher, okay? Who influenced yeah. him? He was a mechanic, okay? And Grace Groner, I mentioned her, one of my favorite investors, okay, who really invested for multiple decades. She was a secretary, a humble person, but she retired, millionaire. And so, you know, I'm interested to hear what pe other people have to say. I yeah. want to hear their stories. And that's how, exactly. that's how I learn Yeah, is when I hear their stories and I hear what's going on for them. Um, this is how I, 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 I learn. And it, 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 that's all part of the journey. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to seeing sort of a, um, what people say on your sub stack. Yeah. And I want to know about compound interest. I want to know 
who is the book being used for? So in terms of Emerson money, is it being used for someone's nephew or niece, someone's grandson, granddaughter? Is it for someone's son or daughter? You know, in future, uh, you know, future book giveaways will be, you know, books maybe by Andrew Hallam, maybe by uh, Ben Carson, Morgan Housel. How are those books being used? Is it going to be a gift for someone? You know, compounding, the compounding effect of reading is critically important. So that's something I'm really keen to learn more about as well. Absolutely. Snowball effect, right? The snowball effect like we mentioned. Absolutely. So Jay, it really is time that investors paid less attention to quarterly earnings results and more attention to Mr. Slough's quarterly book giveaway. <laughs> what do you think, Jay? I think that if, as long as um, you're not trying to cash out right now because the stock market is um, in a bit of a downward turn, but I see it as an opportunity, whereas some people might be seeing it as bad news, I, I look at this and say opportunity. As long as you're not looking at the current stock prices and, and mm -hmm. getting scared, I think that the book opportunity, the book giveaway is a good reason for us to smile if you're not smiling already at the sale prices in the stock market. You got it, Jay. You got it. Okay. So I think that wraps things up for today. One final note, Jay. It's been a bit of a theme here in terms of quarters, but Jay, we're approaching our quarter century. Episode 25 is next. I tell you, how does that make you feel? Episode 25 coming up soon. It's a it's a it's a mixed bag because uh, I'm excited the fact that we're we're 25 episodes in and we're still going strong because I'm not sure um, many people survive they <laughs> they start they they start ambitious you you brought up the story about your dad yeah um, you know he would start something and yeah. um, just he didn't persevere because yeah. perhaps he wasn't interested in it yeah. We've been able to maintain the interest yeah, and yeah. Uh, not only our own interest to talk yeah. about this, but also the interest from your listeners. Indeed. And so that, that keeps me motivated, that keeps me energized, and that keeps me coming back. Definitely. Definitely. All right, listeners, so long until the next time, until episode 25. Have a good one, everyone. We'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. For more tips, follow the Sloth Investor on Twitter at Sloth underscore investor.